Could I invite you to turn with me tonight to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. We'll read from the verse 1. Isaiah 26 verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed in thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord for ever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell in high, the lofty city, he layeth it low, he layeth it low, even to the ground, he bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor, and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou, most upright, doth weigh the path of the just, yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we walked for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favour be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness? In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thine hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 11. And we pray God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this evening is taken from Isaiah chapter 26 verse 4. And it reads, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Now I want you to look at the words everlasting strength for in the margin of the authorized version of the holy scriptures there's an alternative rendering and the alternative rendering is not something that's just been dreamed up by the translators the alternative rendering is the actual wording in the hebrew and of course it's that thought that I want us to focus on tonight. And you can see, if you've got a margin in your Bible, the words everlasting strength are translated in the Hebrew, the rock of ages. And we were just singing there tonight. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And this hymn, of course, was written by the uh, Reverend Augustus Montague, top lady. We've sung it tonight. And what I want us to do, simply this evening, is to learn something about this hymn and its writer. And I want us to think of three things. I want you to think first of all of the life of the Reverend Top Lady. The Reverend Top Lady was saved about the age of 16 years of age. He was born an only child at Farnham in 1740. You can look at the book and say it's there 1740 to 1778. When he was six months old, 
his father died. He stayed at Farnham until he was nine or ten, and then he moved with his mother into the city of Westminster in London. He 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 uh, went to uh, Westminster College there. And in 1775, because his mother had some sort of properties in Ireland, they came to Ireland at 15 years of age. He attended Trinity College, Dublin. And then in 1756, this is when he was converted. He was at Wexford. He was attending an informal meeting in a barn, and he was converted there by an uneducated preacher by the name of Samuel Morris. And the text that the Lord used on that occasion was Ephesians chapter what, chapter 2 and the verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That was the text that Samuel Morris preached on in um August of 1756 and top lady as a boy coming 16 years of age was in the congregation. Now let me quote his own words. Under that sermon I was I trust brought nigh by the blood of Christ in August 1756. Strange that I who had so long sat under the means of grace in England should be brought nigh to God in an obscure part of Ireland among a handful of people met together in a barn and under the ministry of one who could hardly spell his own name. You see, the Reverend Augustus Montague Toplady never forgot the day that he was saved in the barn. He remembered the day. The barn, of course, was a hay shade for cattle, and isn't it a wonderful truth that people can be saved anywhere? You don't need to be saved in a church building. That's a myth. People think, oh, I've got to get saved in church. Well, well that's not right. You, you also, you don't need the minister to be saved. Mrs. Alice Crawford uh, was converted as a teenager in Knockbracken Mission Hall, not very far from killing your schoolhouse. I was saved in a tent at the age of 18. I knew a man that was saved in a field. He, he came under conviction. He, he was ploughing and, and he stopped the tractor and he got out and he got down on his knees in the ploughs and he cried out to God that God would save him. People have been led to the Lord sitting at home. People have been led to the Lord uh, sitting in the passenger seat of a car. Um, people have been led to the Lord in, in their place of employment. I've already told you in the past, uh, Hudson Taylor was saved in a barn. And uh, we think oftentimes young people can be bored. Uh, and they can be bored at home and the summer holidays are coming and it'll not be long till they're saying a few days off school, mummy or daddy, I'm bored. Uh, and we know that young people can be bored in church. Uh, and we understand that. Uh, and we pray for them that the Holy Spirit will warm their heart. Uh, and the Holy Spirit will, will give them the desire uh, that, that they want to be uh, in the house of God, listening to the word of God, filled with a love for, for the Christ of God. But, but Hudson Taylor, he was bored out of his skull. And one day he sneaked into his father's study. He, he found a tract. He thought, oh, I'm going to pass the time here. I, I'm going to read this tract. Uh, and he took the tract into the hay shade. He threw himself down on a pile of, uh, of hay. And he, he intended just to read a little part of the tract. And of course, you know the story. He couldn't stop. He kept on reading. See, the Holy Spirit was at work. The, the Holy Spirit was putting him under conviction. And it was through the reading of that tract that he come to Christ. And remember the text in that tract. Hudson Taylor's text, we've called it. It is finished. And Hudson Taylor came to trust in, in, in the precious blood of Christ. Wasn't John Newton saved on a ship? Think of him as a... Irreverent, um, irreligious type of man, a foul mouthed individual, a drunkard, an adulterer. You would have said, Well, there's no hope for that man. There's no way that man could be saved. That's a hopeless case. You think of the ship being off the coast of Donegal, a big storm engulfing the ship. And what does John Newton do? 
John Newton falls on his knees on the deck and cries to God. You, you see, the reality is you can be saved anywhere. And top lady was a saved man converted at the age of 16 in a barn through the text. And I've already quoted the, the, the text. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And it was those words, made nigh by the blood of Christ, that warmed to top lady's heart. And I asked the question, have you been brought nigh to God by the precious blood of Christ? Have you confessed, Lord, I'm a sinner? Lord, I'm far off. Lord, I'm in the far country, just like the prodigal. Remember, sin will will take us further than we really want to go. Sin will cost us more than than we really want to pay. It wasn't until the prodigal came to his senses that he realised, you know, my life up to this present has all been a waste. I've wasted my life, I've wasted my money. And you know what? Nobody cares about me. And the devil doesn't care about me. He doesn't give two hoots about me. The devil doesn't care about my soul. And, and I have learned to my cost that, that sin pays wages. Sin, you see, will not do the sinner any good. It, it will not benefit the sinner. It, it, in fact, it will be a, 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 a blast as far as the sinner's life is concerned. Because C- sin deceives us. Sin destroys us. Sin's, sin's down to damn us. Here's the prodigal. And he comes to himself. What's happening? I believe he's experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Bible says in Luke 15 uh, verse 20 that he came to himself. He realised I've sinned. He realised I've wasted my life. You you see, think of individuals tonight. And they they don't even realise that they've got a soul and they need to be saved. They've no interest in the things of God. They never read the word of God. Don't come to the house of God. They want nothing to do with God. Until the spirit works. You see without his work. It's all a waste of time. But when the spirit worked. What did the prodigal do? He says I will arise and go to my father. And say father I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight. And when he was a great way off. The father was watching for him. And he experienced the extravagance. Of the father's love. And you know, we who have been brought into Christ, we were in the far country. We were sinners. Sinners by nature and practice. Dead to God. And then all of a sudden, something happened. The Spirit of God warmed our heart. And the Spirit moved us. And we have experienced the wonderful extravagance of the Father's love. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called. The sons of God. Do you realise tonight if you're saved, you're a son of God. If you're saved, you're, you're a daughter of the king. Not only was he a saved man, but I want you to think he lived a short life. If you look at your hymn book, it says, Augustus Montague Top Lady 740. And then you've got the two numerals, 78. Now, now if you're good at sums, and I'm not good at sums, but I'll, I'll try my best. It's easy. 38. Short life. 38 years. And yet he packed a lot in. He packed a lot in as far as the, the work of God is concerned. He did a lot of labour and a lot of good. And he was doing it for God with his eye to eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. And you know, that's the way we should live. Someone has said it's not the years of the life that we live that matters. It's the life of the years that matter. We we could talk about Robert Murray McShane, Dundee. He only had 29 years in this earth. The Lord took him home. But do you know, whenever he died, McShane, he left a legacy. Dundee was rocked to its foundations. People wept. People were broken hearted. They, they, they felt the loss of a man of God. It is not lovely. So live that when you die, you'll be missed. We can't, of course, do everything. Top Lady never tried to do everything. But he wanted to do something for God. 
And when it come to his death, short life, he was ready. He was rewarded. He entered into rest. As the Bible say, in a wonderful sense, and we have preached on it in the past, but we'll preach on it again. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. I've been so blessed this past 24 hours, meditating in that scripture. And I've got so much out of it. I'll preach it some of these Sunday nights. But here's top dating, the life of top dating. He was a saved man who lived a short life. Notice, uh, secondly, the lyrics of Tom Lady. Go, go back to our text. Remember what I said, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For in the Lord Jehovah is the rock of ages. That's the way to read it. And that text, those Hebrew words, the rock of ages, became the basis for Tom Lady writing his famous hymn. But he'll tell you what happened. After he was converted, at the age of 18, he read Thomas Manton's discourse in John 17 and became a convinced Calvinist. He then became a minister in the Church of England. He enjoyed the ministry of George Whitfield, John Gill and William Ramon and many others. And uh, that, that was in 1760. So that was about, what, four, 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 four years after his conversion. And for 16 years he was a minister in the Church of England. But in 1776, that, that's 16 uh, years uh, later, from the time he was in Ireland, he was in a place called um, Burrington Combe, spelt with an E, uh, Mendip Hills, in the county of Somerset. And he was preaching in a little church in, in Blagden. And there's a terrific storm. And he took shelter in a huge limestone rock. And there was a, this rock's a hundred foot high. Now, in fact, it's still there. And there was a, a large crevice in it, fit for the body of a man. And he took shelter there. And he took inspiration from the words that he knew in the Hebrew. For in the Lord Jehovah is the rock of ages. And that was the inspiration for the hymn. And, and there's a plaque there. And the plaque says, This rock is called the rock of ages. This rock derives its name uh, from the well-known hymn, Rock of Ages, written in 1762 by the Reverend Augustus top lady who was inspired to write it while sheltering in its cleft in a storm now many cast doubt in that story a lot of modern scholars you know this is what moderners do they, they cast doubt in things they cast doubt in the bible they, they, they cast doubt in the historicity of christ they, they they cast doubt in his deity and person and work they, they, they cast doubt in the fact he was the son of god and here they are even in relation to a hymn like this a famous hymn uh, one that's well known. In fact, maybe the, the greatest and the best in the English language. And they cast doubt in how it was composed. They tell us it's hearsay. It's only a myth. Stuff of legends. And they attempt to get the reader of the plaque to doubt. But I want to say tonight, thank God for what did happen in 1762. That was a real event. A very important event. A blessed day. Out of the storm came this wonderful hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Doesn't he say the same thing in verse 4? Look at the last two lines, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. The cleft, for, for those that don't know, it's a gap, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crevice, it's, it's a fissure. You, you could say it's like a hole in the rock. Glory to God in Burrington Combe, men dip hills in the county of Somerset. There's only one rock, and it's called the Rock of Ages. 
we have to say tonight that Peter's not the rock. What does the Bible tell us there? And Look at Matthew chapter 16 and isn't it the verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. It says there, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. In the Greek there's Petros. And upon this rock, the word rock is feminine, Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And upon this rock, I believe that Jesus Christ was referring to what Peter had said about him. What did Peter say about him? Verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church is built in Christ, the Son of the living God, not on Peter. Peter's not the rock. And I want to say something else. I denounce those modern versions of the Bible that put in their footnotes, like the NIV. And this is what it does. It puts in the footnote, Peter means rock. And, and, and the unlearned who are reading it think Jesus was saying, I'll build a church in Peter. What's exactly what the church of Rome wants them to believe. Wants them to accept. And of course, it's, it's affecting Historic, biblical, Protestant, Reformed churches. The psalmist could say in Psalm 18 verse 1, The Lord is my rock. There's only one rock. His name's the rock of ages. Over there in Isaiah, um, I, I think it's Isaiah at 96 Sorry, sorry, it's Psalm, it's Psalm 96 uh, and verse um, 22. Sorry, it's 94 and 22. But the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. And my God is the rock of my refuge. Psalm 94 verse uh, 22. Think of the words, rock of ages, cleft for me. Well, what, what does that mean? Open for me. Wounded for me. Pierced for me. The word cleft thinks about an opening. Thank God for Jesus Christ and his death by crucifixion in the tree. Thank God for the opening of the Side of Christ and the shedding of his precious blood. This is one of the most famous hymns ever written by Top Lady. The lyrics was all about Christ. Top Lady died of tuberculosis. In those days, of course, there were little advances in medicine. Uh, this was a, a very serious disease. And uh, glory to God, he was ready. Uh, he was prepared to die and he died in a state of peace. He, he died with the thought from this text of scripture trust ye in the Lord forever. Who or what was he trusting in? The advice was trust ye in the Lord. He, he was trusting in the one to him that was the rock of ages just as he had sheltered in that rock uh, way back in um, the uh, day before his death. We're not to trust in ourselves. We're certainly not to trust in our spirituality, our Bible reading, our prayer life, our holy living. We're not to trust in our experiences. We're not to trust in the church. We're, we're, we're not to, to put our trust and confidence in man. We're to look to the Lord as the rock of ages. He is all we need. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And I just want you to think in closing. Not only the lyrics of the man. Not only the life of the man. But think of the love of the man. 
uppermost and top lady's mind were these words, the rock of ages. And that was his love. You see, he was saved on the rock. Over there, remember we, we sung it this morning, at Psalm 40. Um, the psalmist could say, he, just read it here. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings, and put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and many shall trust in the Lord. And that's exactly what top lady had. He knew that in the rock of ages, he was saved. And he was standing on that rock. And he was secure in that rock. And that rock, of course, was not only a sense of stability to him, but a sense of security. Because the rock, when he was thinking about um, uh, Barrington Combe, in Mendip Hills, outside Somerset, that's there to this day, the plaque's there. The rock of ages, it's a hundred foot high. And that rock is very stable. And he's going nowhere. And there's only one rock. And of course, that's what we're to do. Let's focus on Christ as the rock of ages. Let's consider him as the, the apostle and high priest of our profession. Aren't you glad tonight you're saved? Aren't you glad you're, you're standing in Christ alone? And, and you're secure in him? And you're, you're stable in him? We, we live in a day when many are blowing about by every wind of doctrine. But when your feet's on the rock of ages... There's a stability. There's a security. We're not to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. We're to know, like Paul says, I know in whom I believe it. And I'm, uh, uh, I've committed myself unto him against that day. You know, when we stand on the rock, secure and stable, when things go wrong, we'll be level-headed. When trials and troubles come, <coughs> when we face the agony and reality of bereavement, when bad things happen, and bad things do happen in the life of the Christian, we'll not go into our temper, and we'll not blame God, and we'll not say like Naomi, the Lord have dealt very bitterly with me. I'm blaming him, it's his fault. She buried three of her family, her husband and two sons in ten years. Three tombstones in ten years. Think about that. But if you're in the rock, standing, secure, stable, you'll be level-headed when things go wrong. And even when things are going well, you'll not get overexcited. You'll not be carried away. Not become full of pride. This is vitally important. We need not only to be saved, and not only to be sure and secure in Christ, but I believe in this day we need stability. Certainly in the midst of the devil's attack, in the midst of all the ups and downs of life, we need stability in the work of God. We need stout heartedness and steadfastness. Christian life. Not only was there stability in the rock, but there was strength on the rock. You see, Top Lady knew that he couldn't battle a storm by himself. He knew that he was no match for the elements. And aren't we so weak? We have to admit, Lord, we have no strength in ourselves. We're no match for the enemy. Lord, in all the circumstances and battles of life, what do we need? We need everlasting strength. And where does it come from? It comes from the rock of ages. We could also talk tonight about being supplied uh, by the rock. Look over there as we close at, at Psalm uh, 78. Uh, Psalm 78. Uh, and uh, I think it's the verse 20. And I trust that it's right. Psalm 78 uh, and verse 20. Yes, behold, he smote the rocks, the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. How he can give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? 
You, you think of water from the rock that was smitten. I, I, I noticed, behold, he smote the rock. This was a reference to Moses, that the waters gushed out. And the streams overflowed. Glory to God. You see, the Lord Jesus is abundant supply. And he is the smitten rock. And we get a supply from him. The water of life. And it flows freely. Doesn't the Bible say, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? If we're going to do a wee study in the rock, and I think we did it some time back, there was other things come out of the rock. There was oil come out of the rock. There was honey come out of the rock. You see, all that we need, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the honey is a symbol of the word of God. It, it's all there. Eternal life, the spirit, the word of God. It's supplied out of the rock. One final thing. What about singing in the rock? Turn over there to Isaiah and this would close. You'll be saying amen. Isaiah 42. And just look with me at verse 11. Isaiah 42 and verse 11. It says, Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Isaiah 42 and 11. Can you get the picture? Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. And you see, that's what we've been doing, even from this morning time. Praise him. And the Bible says, um, let the redeemed of the Lord uh, say so. And because we're redeemed, we not only want to speak for him, but we want to, to sing about him. You know, that's why I, I believe in singing the old hymns. That, that, that's why I would refuse to, to go down the road of doing away with a hymn book and bringing in a new modernistic hymn book. Contemporary Christian music is, is flooding into the evangelical church. And you know what? The old hymns have been done away with. They're not being sung. They refuse to sing them. And, and they're missing out so much because the old hymns are full of Christ. The, the old hymns are full of sound theology. To me it's wrong and sinful too not to sing them. These are the songs of Zion. And we can sing them to the glory of God. We can sing them with a heart full of love. Because we're, we're, we're saved by that rock of ages. And we're standing in him. And we're secure and stable. And we've got strength from And we've got supply. Why wouldn't we sing? Let the inhabitants of the rock. That, that's the, those that live in the rock. And on the rock. Let them sing. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. Sing songs in the night and songs in the day. And there was the love of Top Bailey. It was the rock of ages. And he, he focused on that the entire 38 years that he lived. May the Lord bless something as we've learned tonight about his life, his lyrics, and think about his love. Who did he love the most? Ask yourself, who do you love the most? We ought to love the Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these